Today, we're going to look at this. It is probably the most hyped product of 2020 when it comes to coffee at home. It is a grinder by a company called Fellow. It is called The Ode. Now, they launched this on Kickstarter. Now, there are two types of companies that use Kickstarter. There's the kind of traditional kind, what Kickstarter was set up for, which is they want to make a thing. They've got a prototype, but they can't afford some of the cost of manufacturing. So you're, you're kind of helping them kickstart the project and make the thing. Then there is a second kind of company that has its manufacturing pretty much locked down. It's got its prototypes done. And really, it's using Kickstarter to build hype, build interest, and pre-sell a product at a discount. And that's unquestionably what Fellow were doing with the Ode. If you watch their video, well, their Kickstarter was trying to raise a couple hundred thousand dollars. The video promoting the Kickstarter looks to me like a six-figure video. They spent a lot of money marketing this thing, so it was most definitely a pre-sale. And in doing so, they have perhaps set expectations too high. This is a $300 domestic coffee grinder that will not and should not and is not designed to do espresso. It is built for filter coffee and filter coffee only. They're trying to do a good job of that particular set of challenges. They're not trying to compete with something like the niche or, or grinders that are going into that very fine espresso range. So what I want to do today is talk about the grinder. I'm going to split that into two parts. The first part will be the kind of features and functionality of the grinder, how it is to use the little design decisions that they've made uh, and how they might impact your experience using it. Then we'll get into what is ultimately a conversation about the burr set. The, the burrs inside this grinder are interesting. They've made a bunch of decisions that have a bunch of impacts on you, the consumer, and we are going to talk about that. One more quick note, this grinder is a 110 volt US model. I'm running it through a very chunky converter uh, behind the scenes here. This is not an EU model. Fellow very kindly agreed to ship me one uh, from the US stock ahead of time because I wanted to get on and review the product. I, I was a Kickstarter backer, but I was expecting an EU unit. It's also nice that when I give this away, I can give it away to someone on 110 volts instead of usually giving stuff away to people on 220 volts. Anyway, for now, Let's get into an overview of the grinder. Now, first and foremost, this thing is very small. It's beautifully small. I, I think it's a very nicely designed. It's beautiful looking, uh, but it's tiny. Its footprint is small. Its clearance is very low. It will fit under any kitchen cupboards in the world. To do that, They've also pretty much gotten rid of the hopper in a meaningful way. It does have a bean hopper, but it's designed for single dosing. It will hold up to 80 grams of coffee, though it's unlikely someone's single dosing 80 grams very often. On the inside of, of the lid, you do have a grind guide chart. I think this is a bit of a mistake. I think it's a good idea. I just think the execution has some problems, but we'll come back to this when we talk about the burr set itself. Well, you've got your standard safety protections in the top of the hopper, uh, and you're designed to sort of wear what you need, pour it in, hit go. On the front, you've got a very, very large stepped dial. It feels very nice to adjust it. I think the increments are fine enough for a stepped grinder. I don't think you need a stepless grinder in this kind of a situation. I think stepped is absolutely fine. Uh, and then the only other thing that you're really interacting with on the front of the grinder is the on-off button here. It does beep, and I don't know why, because, you know, I know it's on, I can hear the motor. I don't need to be beeped to, to be reminded of that. But that aside, as you can hear, the motor itself is actually pretty quiet, and when it comes to grinding coffee, this thing's also relatively quiet too. Now, they've done a couple of things that are interesting here with the ground catch bin, as I think they're called. Here you'll see a magnet, and here is a magnet. So this thing very neatly clicks into place, so it's always exactly where it needs to be, and that's nice. Inside here, there's a little lid, uh, are some fins, and this is designed to help the flow of pouring ground coffee one small complaint, though, is this little rubber lid, unless it's perfectly seated, right, if you don't quite get it on right, then it doesn't, doesn't do the magnet thing properly. So, you know, that for me is a little tiny frustration in what should be a very pleasing experience otherwise. One more thing before I forget is it does have this thing, a little knocker on the side of things. Now, these you see on big commercial grinders, um, they've just got a bag knock, usually, or something like that. It's designed to knock out the last few grounds that might be stuck inside the exit chute of the grinder. If I'm honest, it's a nice idea, but it doesn't work. 
And, and to explain how and why, let's grind some coffee. Now, one quick thing, early on people were concerned that the magnet at the bottom of this would interfere with the load cell of a, a nice uh, weighing scale. That hasn't been the case for me, though it does stick, and, and, and that's kind of annoying. It, again, its position doesn't really impact its accuracy in terms of the scale, so I know that the weight is the weight, I'm not worried about that. But it is a slightly odd part of the experience when your, your beans bin and your scale are sort of stuck together. Coffee in. Now I'll push go. This grinder does have an auto off detection. You'll hear the coffee grind and then you'll hear it run a little bit more and then it should switch off pretty quickly after that. Coffee done. That took a little while. Now, generally speaking, it hasn't taken a long time. Let me just click my bag knocker and take this out. Generally speaking, it's maybe run four or five seconds over, and occasionally it has run a bit longer like that. The way that this is working is it's sort of detecting resistance in the burrs, and so if a little bit of coffee is retained somewhere, somehow, and it still feels a touch of resistance, it'll keep trying to grind it through. So what we should have now is all of the coffee out, right? We put 15 grams in, we should have 15 grams out. That generally hasn't always been the case. Generally speaking, there might have been a little bit of, of coffee retained. What you're starting to see right now, here, is a bit of static issue, right? Quite a lot of chaff tends to end up all over the place. Uh, it's, it's kind of messy on the lid here, as well as inside the beans cup as well. Now these fins, they might guide the coffee effectively, but they also trap it and hold it back a little bit too. And I, I find them a bit frustrating to use. So a nice neat pour, but Obviously, unless I keep shifting and changing the angles, it will retain some coffee in there. And as you can see, if I give it a tap, there's just quite a lot of, uh, of staticky chaff around the place. The question is, did we get everything out of the grinder? If I go back and knock it now, if the knocker was effective, nothing should come out. That for me has been a consistent aspect of this grinder, just this retention of both chaff and some finer grounds there as well in that kind of exit chute. And the knocker straight away doesn't seem to be particularly effective if there is a bit of static electricity around to really help it cling onto the exit chute. You can go to Fellow's website and have a look at what they recommend and uh, what pleases me in a funny sort of way is that they recommend checking out one of my videos on a quick technique to reduce static. And in that, basically you just add a tiny droplet of water to your beans before you grind them and that really does help mitigate static. So if you haven't seen this uh, video, essentially get a teaspoon, get the handle a touch wet, and just adding that tiny, tiny droplet of water to the beans really can make a big difference. I mean, that is very quick. A little slow to notice that it's empty though. Better than last time. So that's usually about as much as it runs over. And honestly, I don't mind it running over a little bit because I'm usually doing other things in the coffee making process and not necessarily worrying about is the grinder shutting off by itself or not. If it shuts off five or 10 seconds after it finishes, that's fine by me. So we do still have a bit of static. Some still inside here, but it's a bit better. Still some on the lid. Here, you can just see that this seems to just attract uh, the chaff from the coffee beans in particular, but overall a slightly less staticky, messy experience. Now, this is a harsh environment to review a grinder in. We're, we've got a dark worktop, a dark grinder. This one, to be honest though, is just a little bit messier than any of the other domestic grinders that I've used. It's notably messier than say the Wilfie Uniform. I think it's messier than the Niche, but it's not the messiest grinder I've ever used by any stretch. Now, I'm gonna brew some coffee next, talk about the burr set. Before I do that, I think this is a really important point. There was a lot of hype about this grinder. There was a lot of excitement about this grinder. And I think, unfortunately, expectations have been set too high. Does this grinder meet people's expectations? That's a difficult question to answer. Is this grinder worth $300? Is there something better for $300 that does a better job? That's a different question to answer. That's not about the hype, that's not about the excitement, it's not about the newness and the marketing campaign and all of that kind of stuff. Is it good value for money? And, and as I'm critical of this, it, you know, you should know that I would be critical of other grinders at the same price point for similar things. Grinders like this tend to be a bit messy. Grinders like this tend to have a little bit of retention in their systems. This is not new or unusual 
you know, th this is competitive, I think, at its price point, but let's brew some coffee and talk about that a little bit more. just while the water heats, I've weighed out 30 grams of coffee. I'm gonna brew a 30 to 500 pour over. Now their range says, I really should be in the, the sort of four to five zone. And you would think uh, a one cup pour over would therefore be closer to four, maybe a two cup or a three cup is closer to five. In my experience, this is way too coarse for the kind of roast that I'm typically working with. In fact, for this, I'm gonna brew this down at, at sort of two on the grind dial here, uh, which is, you know, a lot finer than they would typically recommend by this guide. But it, but if I brew coarser in their range, the brew just happens very quickly. And you might think, oh, does that mean less fines? No, not necessarily. It means the grind is just much coarser. So let's, let's grind this at two. And let's say I put exactly 30 grams in, coming out, 29.1 actually. So that suggests that there's quite a lot of ground still stuck in here. And yeah, there's a fair bit. There's a fair bit stuck inside. While this blooms, before reviewing this grinder, I put a kilo and a half through at the finest setting. I then re-zeroed the burrs according to Fellow's instructions because I felt that was a good point to test this grinder out. Brand new burrs do tend to produce a slightly different grind profile than um, burrs that have seen a little bit of usage, sort of working burrs. For those keeping score, I'm using the bagged Harrier filters with the tab in case you want to compare your brew times to mine, I'll let you know what the total drawdown time is here. And if you want to know why filter coffee papers matter, there's a video up here too. So that's a 320 brew at the point that I had finished drawing down the liquid and the bed went dry. That's not a particularly slow brew by any stretch for this kind of a pour, indicating that either there's no fines or less fines than you might expect, or that the grind is perhaps oh, acceptable, but almost still a tiny touch coarse. I should say this should be pretty close. I'd be surprised if this isn't a tasty cup of coffee, but I would be thinking about brewing maybe a touch finer the next time with this particular paper dose brew kind of setup that I have here. While this cools, to speak to the brews that I've had from this grinder so far, I've had some very enjoyable brews of coffee. I haven't had, uh, you know, a horrible taste profile from a poor grind distribution. It doesn't taste like it's producing a ton of fines or anything upsetting like that. It doesn't taste like there's too many boulders or large pieces of coffee coming through. It tastes like it's doing a really very good job grinding the coffee and certainly comparable to the best grinders in that price point. Now, while that's still a little bit hot, it's pleasant, but it, it is a little bit weak. It's a little bit under extracted for me. Uh, I think I was right in that I would want to go, the next time I brewed this, I would want to go a little bit finer. This isn't the kind of brew where I want to throw it in the sink and start again and I'm cross. I would drink this in the morning and be like, eh, it's a tasty brew of coffee. It could just basically be a, a little bit more textured, a little bit sweeter, a little bit more complexity. It just says, I've ground a little bit too coarse. And that is, I, I think, one of the frustrations with this grinder in that if I used darker roasts, this might be true. But what is true in my particular world is that pour over is actually finer than my cup and grind. We did the world's largest coffee tasting recently. Um, this sort of two here wouldn't be too far away from what we used for a cup and grind. My pour over grind for a two cup is actually finer than that cup and grind. If you still have your reference sample, it's not much finer, but it is a little bit finer. So for, for me, they're sort of setting you up to fail unless you're using more developed darker roasted coffee, and that might be who they think their audience is. But amongst the people that I see be excited about this grinder and hopeful for this grinder are a lot of people who like lighter roasts of coffee. Now, I brew a French press at the same grind setting that I brew a cupping at, because they're the same brew method to me, just the same kind of technique. Again, that's much finer than most people expect. Here, for the French press, there is an enormous range, six, through to 10, almost entirely dedicated to, to French press from Fellow's perspective, but that is way, way coarser than anything I would use for a French press. Now, I don't wanna get drawn to this too much. I, I presume that cold brew could work at nine through 11, and I presume they've made it go to 11 because they watch too much Spinal Tap as well. But for me, almost half of what this grinder can do isn't usable grind size. I don't ever really need to go that coarse most of the time. And my usable grind size really is only this half of the dial, which for me is a frustration. 
especially because by the time you get down to one, I'm not sure if you're brewing a one cup V60 of light roasted coffee, I'm not sure that's fine enough. And how is that? Why is that? Why does this grinder not go as fine? Especially when, as you adjust it, you can hear the burrs touch. And for that, we're gonna to have to open up the grinder and talk about the decision they made around the burrs themselves that is, I think, very interesting, but has a massive impact on the capability and range of this particular grinder. If you wanna take apart the grinder, there are a few videos on Fellow's own website showing you how to do this. Obviously, unplug it. So to start with, you just take off this front plate here. So if you take off the first four screws at north, south, east, west, that allows this plate to come off, and that allows you then to get in and adjust and, and re-zero that front burr's position. This is something you might want to do within the first month or two of owning the grinder if you notice that it isn't going as fine as it used to. And then there's a few more screws and we can access the burrs themselves. So this grinder is the moving burr here. It's driven by the motor and it acts against this stationary burr here at the back. You can see that the coffee exits out of this little chute here and you can see actually there's quite a bit of buildup here on the chute, which is not ideal. Now the design of these burrs I think is very, very interesting. They look initially like regular flat burrs and the way that those work is that it's the gap between the burrs that determines the grind size. Here, it's a little bit different. These teeth on the edge of this burr stand up away from the cutting surface here. And this actually prevents the burrs from getting too close before they start to touch. They're called interlocking burrs. Because of the nature and the design of the cutting teeth here, you can't get the burrs any closer without them touching than produces actually a relatively coarse grind. With regular flat burrs, when they're almost touching, that's when you're producing this super fine grind, this kind of espresso fine grind, or even finer sometimes. Here, this just isn't possible because the burrs will touch and, and contact and it can't be done. And that to me is a very interesting design decision because you can put regular flat burrs in here. In fact, people have already started changing the burr sets out on this. SSP, a, a, a burr manufacturer from Korea, produces burrs that fit this grinder that are uh, brew-focused flat burrs that will allow you to go much, much, much finer than the stock burrs would do. However, you'd be taking a $300 grinder and spending another $190 to upgrade it. In the future, I might look at that combination and, and how it fares at, say, $500 compared to other $500 grinders. But for now, we're really reviewing this as a stock item. And so for, for me, I really don't understand the decision to go with interlocking burrs on this particular grinder. I did reach out to Fellow and ask them this particular question. At the time of recording, they hadn't come back to me, but if they do come back to me, I'll cut me in telling you what they said. So right after we finished recording, uh, I got an email from Fellow. They said they picked the interlocking burrs, one, because of grind distribution. They looked at the, the kind of grind profiles from various burrs, they liked this one the best. And secondly, they did taste testing too. And again, they liked the interlocking set the best. They do acknowledge that it doesn't go super fine, and they said they're going to work on some new burrs that will be available to Kickstarter backers at a deeply discounted rate coming in the future that will let you go 1 to 200 microns finer. So just bear all this in mind as you watch the rest of the video. Now, I will be doing one more video with this grinder before I give it away. I'll compare it to the Wilfie Uniform and then the Zio Leo. I'm not sure about pronunciation, actually, it's been hard to find out. Uh, a small ghost teeth grinder that cost $130 from AliExpress. I'll put those three side by side because I think they're an interesting combination and comparison of grinders at different price points with different availabilities. This grinder after that will be given away to one of my Patreon supporters. They give me a budget each month to go out and buy these things and review them. And I'm not reliant on manufacturers' freebies or loaners, and I can give you an honest, unbiased review. And let's summarize the review of this thing here. It's $300, and I think that puts it at an interesting price point. From a features perspective, it's packed full. You know, it's nice that it has an auto off, I think that's good, even though it's not super, super accurate, that doesn't bother me. The design, I think, is beautiful. I think it's a lovely looking grinder. I think the footprint is fantastic. It is small, it is neat, it would look great in any kitchen. I think they've done great work with the design. 
I think the grind setting experience, the grinding experience is mostly good. It's a, it's a pretty messy grinder. I'd say it's a touch messier than other grinders at that same price point, but they are not perfect by any stretch but it is a little bit messy when it comes to static and, and chaff all around the place. Though ultimately, the thing for me, the, the deciding factor for you if you're thinking about buying this is, does it grind fine enough? And for me, if I'm honest, it doesn't. I want to go finer for a one cup pour over than this would let me. I might want to go finer for an AeroPress, for example, or even sometimes a mocha pot in some cases. This doesn't let me do that, and that's frustrating. If I was brewing more developed coffees, darker roasts, I wouldn't have a problem, but I'm not. I'm brewing pretty light roasts and trying to get the most complexity and sweetness out of them. That needs a fine grind. I think it has a lot of positives going for it. I think they've tried to pack it full of detail, though it hasn't always, I think, worked out as well as they might have hoped. There's tons of information from Fellow on their website about maintenance. It's pretty easy to get into, to look after. It's easy to upgrade the burrs inside it, and that does make it an interesting proposition. But again, as stock, it's so nearly what I want it to be, but it's not quite there. Now they sold nearly 5,000 of these on the Kickstarter, so there must be thousands out there in the wild now. Hopefully some of you are watching this video. I'd love to hear from you down in the comments below. Did your experience mirror mine or have you had a different one? Is there something you love that I didn't touch upon? Is there something you hate that I didn't touch upon? I'd love to hear from you down in the comments below. But for now, I'll say thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great day.